So, I, I want to do a talk on Pentecost. Because today is Pentecost. Today is the birthday of the church. It is the basis. It is the basis. You're just hurt because you lost an argument, Kyle. I just schooled you about atheism. So, come and listen to me, guys. I'm far more interesting. So, ladies and gentlemen, today the church commemorates the birth of its own community. Today the church celebrates in its calendar the fact that it exists, the fact that it was born. The church emerged in stages from the Jewish community, of which the final stage was the day of Pentecost. And we read about Pentecost in Acts 2, verses 1 to 13. And I'm going to read it, and I'm going to give commentary on it as we go forward. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly they came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. The church was born supernaturally. It was born as the temple of God. Christ blew on his apostles and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Christ promised that when he ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit would come. The Old Testament taught that the Holy Spirit, the name of God as it was known, would rest in the temple and that the Spirit of God was the sign of the presence of God. The apostles received the Holy Spirit who gave them gifts to work works according to their needs, according to the work of the gospel. And they spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so we recognize as Christians that the gifts that to do the work of God in the kingdom of God is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And that is the Holy Spirit that distributes those gifts. So the Holy Spirit cannot be a, a, a mere force as Jehovah's Witnesses believe. But it is personable and it is making decisions. The Holy Spirit must manifested itself in the real world. Now there were Jews who were living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Let us be clear about what this miracle was. The miracle was not that the apostles were speaking in Aramaic or in Arabic or in Greek or in Latin. The miracle was that the people heard what the apostles were saying in their own language. The tongues that they spoke were translated universally to the hearers and each hearer heard it in their own language. The scriptures teach that the gifts of the Spirit are active to testify to the validity of the preaching of the apostles. The problem with some Christians is that they are looking for the works of the Spirit 
not for the truths of the teachings of the apostles. The works of the Spirit confirm the preaching. They follow the preaching. They do not lead. Many Christians look for signs. They go to churches looking for the miraculous. This is the wrong kind of spirituality. As Christians, we should look for the faithfulness of the teachings of the apostles, knowing that those who grow in theosis, those who grow in sanctity, the works of God will follow them. The church for 2,000 years has bore witness to the miraculous. Miracles have occurred in the church for 2,000 years. And we have always bore witness to those miracles. However, the miraculous is not the universal claim of the church. There are miracles in other religions. I say this as a Christian. The miracles don't prove that a religion is true. The miracles are only given as a confirmation of the teaching by the Spirit of God. But the dynamic, also able to work supernatural miracles in imitation to deceive and to lie. A true miracle is one that points you towards Christ and not one that points you away from Christ. It goes on that the people that heard this voice were bewildered because each of them was hearing them speak in their own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language, to which we were born, Parthian and Midis, and Elamite, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and the visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongue, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. The Spirit of God speaks in the language of all peoples. The Christian faith is revealed in the language of all peoples. What a contrast to Islam that is. Islam says for you to be a good Muslim, you have to read an Arabic book and pray in Arabic. But the Bible teaches that when the Spirit of God was calling all nations and all peoples to the apostolic faith, he allowed those peoples to hear the message in their own language. And it is for that reason that we Christians believe that the Bible can be faithfully translated to any language, whether that language is Tamil, whether that language is Romanian, whether that language is Arabic or Urdu. Every people can hear the truth in their own language. We don't have to Arabize like they do in Islam where they believe they have to learn the message in the Arabic tongue. This is why we Christians believe in the validity of translation. And it goes on. It states that the apostles were testifying to the deeds of God. That is what it is to be God's witnesses. 
when Christ said, you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. We are to testify to the works of God in the world. It say we believe as Christians. Ubi caritos et amor Deus ibi est. Where there is love, there is God. Where God's love can be found, God's presence and work can be found. And we Christians are called to embody that love as a community. Christ said that the world will know that the Father has sent me by the way you love one another. And so we Christians are to walk in good works, in acts of mercy, to transform the world so that it is discipled by the teachings of Christ. And we are called to change our own being, to embody the works of God on earth through works of mercy. This is how we witness to the work of God through living out transformed lives that change ourselves, that change our community, that change our society and that change the world. What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are filled with sweet wine. Let us be clear that principalities and powers and authorities that are governed by demonic forces rage against the will of God, rage against the Spirit of God, rage against Christ's dominion over our society and world. And so where the Spirit of God is at work, the devil will raise his militants to oppose the work of the gospel. And so we see those workers of iniquity, those followers of satanic influence in communist ideologies, as followed by Kyle over there, as followed by Islamic militants, as we see amongst the Muslim speakers here, as followed by ethno-nationalists who wish to divide the church based upon ethnicity. The enemies of the gospel are many and we Christians must recognize that the church has real enemies. The idea of the armor of God as spoken about in Ephesians as over spiritualizing the principalities and powers and authorities of this world when the scriptures say that the devil is the God of this world it means that the devil has his own disciples and those disciples rage against the church they rage against God and they rage against his kingdom and they persecute it by discriminating against Christians, by bombing Christian churches, by anti-Christian pogroms, by preaching against the gospel, by attacking the Christian community. And we Christians must organize ourselves in a way that defends the church, defends the gospel and advances the kingdom of God against the real enemies of the church. Brother, you wanted to ask a question. Uh, you keep using the word God. Can I ask you what is it? So, the question is, what do I mean by God? What I mean by God is the ancient God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The creator of all things, who created everything ex nihilo by the power of his word, Jesus Christ. And who entered into covenant with Adam and Eve, with Noah, with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And finally, through the person of Jesus Christ, has entered into covenant with his holy church. 
This God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, is who I am referring to. He is called Yahweh. He is the one that I call you to worship. The only true God. The only God worthy of worship. The name which is above all other names. Any other questions? Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. You said that God is a creator, I believe. Yes. So can I call that creator Big Bang? It's just a name. Okay. You just gave me a name. I, I, I meant to ask you what is behind the name. Yes. But you haven't said much. You just said creator. Yes. So I can call it anything I like. Okay, allow me to reply to that. I, I call it Big Bang. If that is okay, is that okay? No. And let me explain why. Because as a Christian, the, when we say that God is the creator of all things, we're making a distinction between contingent being and necessary being. All that exists, all that exists, not for the first time, all that exists in this world are contingent beings that sit within a chain of contingency. When we say that God is the creator of all things, yeah. we're saying he sits outside of this contingency of being and his being is necessary being. In other words, there is no conceivable world in which that being does not exist. The Big Bang is a contingent event that stands on other contingent events. Incidentally, the Big Bang was proposed by a Roman Catholic priest, thus demonstrating that Christianity and science are not in conflict, as many like to assume. Any other questions on the topic? Thank you. Sorry? Did the Arab language exist 3,000 years ago because Muslims people say we should follow the Quran in Arabic? Um, and they said that they didn't have religion, but did uh, Arab Islam exist in the Middle Ages? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 So the sister asks a great question. I'm doing a Q&A, bro. You can't ask all the questions. Just wait and you can come back. No, let me address her question, then you can come back, sir. So you're not interested in my reaction to what you answer? Sir, I'm doing a Q&A. Let the lady ask a question. You've asked two questions. Let me answer her question and then I'll come back to you. Okay, great. Right. So in answer to the lady's question, there is a conundrum within Islamic teaching. Muslims claim that the word of Allah, which we find in the Quran, is eternal. That it always existed. And Muslims claim that Arabic is that word. But that means there's a problem, ladies and gentlemen. The reason why that's a problem is because we can trace out the evolution of the Arabic language. We know how it emerged. We know where it emerged. We know how it developed. It comes out of Syriac. It comes out of Syriac. And that's why you can find Syriac loan words in the Arabic Quran. One of the chapters of the Quran yeah. is Tamar. Ah. Tamar yeah. means mountain in Syriac Aramaic. Ah. And Muslims say that's what Tamar means in their Quran. But you go and ask any everyday Muslim what's the Arabic for word for mountain what did they say? and they don't say Tamar. Ah. Which means that yeah. The idea of an eternal Quran is bogus right, because no. the Arabic language yeah. emerged socially, culturally and economically like every other language and it gets worse, uh, worse. <laughs> the Quran has, I can't remember the exact number, so let's just say 5,000 words. That's the wrong number by the way, but let's just pretend it's 5,000 words. Are you telling me that before Muhammad spoke the words of the Quran, 
that those 5,000 words didn't exist in the Arabic language? Of course they existed in the Arabic language. Uh, because that's how Muslims understand what Muhammad was saying. And are you honestly telling me that no Arab in history could ever have constructed a sentence in the Arabic language that we can't find in the Quran? Of course they could. So the idea that we have, let's say, 5,000 eternal words that could not be imitated is a completely ridiculous preposition. It's a completely preposterous proposition. By contrast, what do we Christians believe? We believe that God spoke to us through the words of men. All of our scriptures are the words of men. All of our scriptures are men's words inspired by God. Which means that it's okay for those languages to evolve. We're not claiming that these particular words are eternal. We're not saying that one language is more sacred than another. And that is why Christianity offers the dignity to every people to worship God in their own tongue, unlike Islam, which puts Arabic above everyone else's culture. Any other questions? I'll take one more question before I stop. One more question now on the topic. Any questions? Going once. Going uno. Going twice. Going dos. Going three times. Going tres. Happy birthday, church. Yay! Happy Pentecost. Christ is risen. 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 Jesus is Lord. Yes. Okay. Can a man die for your sins?